Hello, and welcome to the Flowering She Rose Budcast. My name is Anna, or for the purpose of this podcast, Anahita, Bearer of Roses. I'm here to bridge plant and human consciousness as we gather in this virtual garden and explore how plants can help us awaken our feminine essence. It's my prayer that these personal stories, transmissions, and medicine music may remind you of the sacredness of this magical life and the power that lies in your intuitive nature. Hi, friends, welcome back. This is episode nine of the Flowering She Rose Budcast. Today's conversation is with Zoe Eccles of Life Gazing and Earth Being. We're going to be talking about bridging the worlds of science and spirit, the masculine and feminine pathways to awakening. And if you enjoyed the last episode with Christina Louise about deepening our intimacy with nature, coming into our bodies, into our senses, and the importance of earth-based awakening, then you're definitely going to like today's conversation as well. Bridging also seems to be part of Zoe's mission in general. Zoe is a storyteller, weaving her stories out of words, images, and videos. She's trained as a historian and works as a photographer, And she's engaged in a lifelong journey, both through the physical world, which she travels, living for parts of the year on the road, and through the world of thought, as she continues to learn through self-assigned schooling. Her current projects cover a vast area as she aims to bridge various disciplines and fields, the scientific, the historic, and the spiritual, the literary and the photographic, to find a larger story that will spark a change in society guiding people to remember their human selves and their place on this planet. Zoe grew up in New Zealand, but I think that part of her family is American. And in case you start wondering about her accent once we start our conversation, it's that unique blend of New Zealand and American where she's currently spending the winter before then starting her travels again in the spring. It's really beautiful to have a guest on this episode that isn't necessarily a practitioner or a teacher, but um, embodies the archetype of a storyteller. So first, I thought that Zoe and I would be talking about fairies and connecting and building relationships with trees, because Zoe has some YouTube videos up about those subjects, and that would definitely be in line with this show. We decided, though, that if you're interested in that, you can just go and check out her YouTube videos Um, and that it doesn't make sense to recreate content that's already out there. We wanted to let ourselves be guided by what's alive in this moment. And we ended up having a free flow conversation, less of an expert interview because that felt most authentic. Zoe has a special offer for our Patreons starting at the Rosebud level. She has created a discount code for her online offerings. So the portals in the Wheel of the Year, which you'll learn more about in her mindfulness course. And you can retrieve that over on Patreon where you can pledge a monthly amount and become part of the community surrounding this podcast and support the show. All right. And so now, If you're also in the womb of winter, I invite you to bundle up, grab a cup of herbal tea, and enjoy today's conversation. Yeah, Zoe, I think it's been like three years at least since I first Mm. downloaded your New Moon Musings newsletter and found your website, lifegazing.com. Yeah. And so somehow you feel like a a dear sister of mine, even though we've never connected in person much except for over Mm. Instagram. Um, And I feel like you have a real gift when it comes to seeing the natural world through a very special lens of um, mindfulness, you could say, but also perhaps like very awake and aware sensuality. Um, Mm. And I was wondering if you wanted to explain where the name of your website, Life Gazing, and your other website, Earth Being, came from and how that connects to you of course okay well life gazing um it was born out of this time in my life that wasn't so pleasant actually it was a time when I was involved in an abusive relationship for about five years um and I was 
between 15 and 20 years old. And I was taking a lot of the things that I had learned as a child about, um, I was very curious about magic and about Buddhist theory and practice and things like this. But um, I felt like I had lost a lot of that because the abusive relationship kind of took a lot out of me. And also the guy was not very keen on me practicing old things that I had been doing. So I took everything I knew and I turned it into this website at the time. It was more of a blog and it was called Life Gazing and Wild Strawberries. And it was my attempt at looking at the world, looking for any kind of joy and Mm. beauty that I could find. Because it seemed at that time like in the bigger picture, things were really awful. Like if I thought too much about what was going on and stuff, it was too much to handle. But when I was able to step back and look at the little details, like the things that are seem eternal, you know, like the stars, it was like things were still okay <laughs> in a sense. And so it was born out of that and it really turned into something else. It's very interesting because life gazing at that time meant to me, it was kind of like cloud gazing and the word gaze means to look in awe at something. And I was, I had this idea of like looking at life in awe But now, I think it's very multi-layered, and it kind of morphed into the new thing, the earth being thing too, which, again, has these multi-layered ideas. It's like, you know, earth being, I am a being on earth, but earth being is about being like with the earth as well. Um, Yeah, I guess mindfulness goes into that, but I think it's more than that. I think it's like a, a way of telling stories with a point of view and a perspective. I think one of your signatures is having an eye for the details as well as the grand picture of of beauty on earth. I think you're an amazing photographer as well. And you also like to share little snippets um, from your personal journal, things that you noticed along your travels throughout the world on Instagram. Yes. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I've been doing this media retreat with uh, a group of women, really amazing women. And it's, it's more than a retreat, it's a kind of rebellion as well. And we've been talking about um, this idea of coming back to ourselves, people that we used to be before, I guess, the online world kind of took over. And I've been remembering that back in the day, I did, I took a lot more pictures that were less. Um, you could say aesthetically pleasing and a lot more to do with the meaning behind them. To me, it would be like, you know, I, I would be having a moment where I'm chopping celery in the kitchen and I'd be like, this is such a beautiful feeling, like something about this in life and the smell of the celery and things. And then I'd take a picture and it wouldn't look very good, but to me, it was capturing something else. And I kind of almost want to revert back to some of that. (laughs) I think that, over time, the internet has led me to become a little more polished, perhaps, mm-hmm. which is good. And, and it has its cons too. So yeah, I see what you mean. Because now, I guess the lens with through which you look upon things around you also takes into consideration whether it's Instagrammable. Yes, that is a huge thing. And I was actually watching something recently. It was very interesting. Um, I forget who was doing the talk. It was a talk by this guy and he was saying that the way we view reality now, um, especially in the age of Instagram and Snapchat, like with stories, it's like we're thinking about the story that we are going to tell in the future. And so um, instead of acting in the present and then telling the story later, we are acting in, in a way that We know we want to tell this story. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So we begin to think about how do I want to frame this? How does this look? When I first started life gazing, it really came out of this whole feeling of um, living first and living so much and loving this kind of presentness about life and like filling up on that till it almost had to overflow and I had to create from that and I had to share it in some way. And now I find myself and maybe others too are coming to this kind of point where it's like, we're not so much doing the life thing first. We're not Mm -hmm. living first (laughs) as much. Um, And I definitely, I'm very conscious of that and what I do, making sure that life comes first and then the creation. 
Mm. Yeah, it also sounds like that evolution from life gazing to then also earth being was kind of like almost like a downward movement from something that had to do more like with clouds and perhaps being an observer oh. of what's going on around you to really oh. becoming part of the earth and realizing, hey, I'm not a separate onlooker of all things in the natural world around me. But I mean, part of your offers on earth being are also these goddess photo shoots where you're portraying women in nature, right? Really immersed and touching the elements. Um, I never thought of it in that sense, but really you're right. I think earth being came in about at a time. It was after I had this amazing trip to Iceland. We were there for about a month and we began by hitchhiking, but then we lived in a car. <laughs> Before we left, I um, set this goal that I was going to familiarize myself with the chakras. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was looking at it in an archetypal way. So the chakras as being kind of archetypes for different ways of being, because I was really familiar with um, the upper ones, like the heart, the throat, the third eye, things like that. I had known about those and felt um, connected to those chakras for a long time, probably since I was a child. But um, if you had asked me about, say, what is the solar plexus, I would not be able to give you a clear answer. So <laughs> I decided before going to Iceland that I was going to start from the root and work my way up. And it coincided perfectly. Iceland is this place that, oh boy, it's like, it's like you're returning to this young earth because I think the island itself has been formed out of um, volcanic rock uh, quite recently. I'm probably going to get this wrong, but <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think that it was fairly recent in the history of the earth and you can feel that it's, it's like the earth below you is still warm. Um, there's geothermal energy everywhere. Mm. There's, there's steam coming out of the ground and you're so um, close to the mother, you know, this, this being Gaia, you feel her so present there and it's you and her alone sometimes because there's, I think 300,000 people on the island, there's so many times where it was just Oliver and I and nobody else in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> wandering around with no fences, no cars, no nothing. Hmm. And that rootedness gave me a new perspective on how important it was to not only conceptualize rooting down into the earth, but to actually practice it. So I, I honestly feel that there's like an intellectual knowingness that we can have where we can talk in words and think and um, conceptualize things and learn stuff. But to act in a bodily way, to know things bodily was very different. And it was like an awakening. And I think earth being came a little after that, if I'm trying to remember correctly. <laughs> so yeah, it is something that comes from that space of um, wanting to immerse and get down into the body, into the ground. What you're talking about is actually super relevant. And I also share this experience of being really familiar with the upper chakras, being a naturally more etheric being connected to the multidimensional yes. realms, also the fey oh, realms, wow. you know, the, the areas <laughs> beyond the veil. And I think that for most of my life, I wasn't even fully embodied. I have this tendency right now to be very um, outspoken and I <laughs> might offend some people, but really, honestly, I think the women are leading the way in this sense in um, the spiritual circles that I kind of revolve in because there is the old patriarchal way, which seems very heady, very much centered around intellectualism. And this theme that we keep seeing, I don't know if this is something in your world, but I see it a lot with my friends and stuff where we talk about ascension and transcendence. And it's very like upward facing, you know, like going up, 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 up. And um, there's less talk, I guess, of a return to the earth. And I think that especially after some of the things that I have been researching recently about um, ancient women's religions, I'm a huge proponent of the 
the concept of like rooting down again <laughs> as human beings. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You're, you're so in line with the entire theme of this podcast. And I'm so glad you're saying it. And um, Christine and I were oh, talking about exactly that process. Bethan and I were talking about it in our episode about Avalon, how yeah. there's two ways to enlightenment. There's that ascension process, which many of us have at the beginning of our spiritual journey. There's an awakening. You're like, oh totally. yeah. yeah, affirmations, positive thinking, everything's starting to go so well. <laughs> yes, I'm yeah. like, I'm so close to right? enlightenment. Woohoo. Yeah. And then something <laughs> shifts and you know, you're all vegan and you're yeah. all like an angel. Um, you right. want to do everything right in this life <laughs> and you kind of forget your animal instincts. Oh my gosh. That speaks to me. That speaks to my story, but it also speaks to um, so many of my friends' stories and this, this kind of realization of, you know, like, wait, hold on. Okay. So I learned all of these things and I, I'm being so positive and I'm, yes, like you said, vegan and I'm doing all these great, wonderful things. And I'm, I'm almost angelic, <laughs> as you say, like this, feeling of rising and ever rising but then it reminds me of um, a story I once heard of um, a monk he's sitting in his room he likes to meditate a lot and he likes to really go deep and everything and he chants as he meditates but um, there's this cat outside that bothers him sometimes it's really annoying and it makes this crazy sound <laughs> you know how cats do and one day he just cannot stand it and he gets up and he goes out and he kind of I don't know maybe in the story he kicks the cat or he gets really mad essentially and the the moral of the story is he's missing the point like just because you can meditate in in a quiet room does not mean you can go out into life and actually function <laughs> in that way sometimes it's like of course, it's easy when you're surrounded by all this quietness and, and beauty and serenity, but life is not generally like that. And I think that it takes so much more courage and bravery and skill even to go deep into the, the darker parts to actually, um, yeah, face the humanity in you. Yeah, exactly. That's what yeah. makes us whole. It's our sacred darkness. And mm. I, I do think, you know, spiritual bypassing is something that many people go through at the beginning of their spiritual journeys. And it, it has its yeah. purpose, of course. And um, so I yeah. wouldn't even want to say that it was bad that I went through those years of thinking that I'm never angry. But I'm really no, glad I to have then one day uh, realized that I was cutting part of my power off by oh thinking gosh, that wow. and uh there's so much so much truth to what you were saying about how this um ascension process this upward moving path mm -hmm. of enlightenment is mm, by nature more masculine and this yeah. descending um embodiment uh earth-based mm -hmm. awakening um really more archetypal feminine yes I think it's important to have both too. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that one or the other is negative. I think that maybe we've just forgotten perhaps one side. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I think yeah. there's truth to you when you're saying like, it's more the women that are awakening to the descension process and to anchoring yeah. the light in the lower chakras. Um, maybe because that really is more the path of the feminine and you know, nowadays there are these traditions that have come to the West um, yeah. from the Far East, like yoga. And while I'd say they are wonderful for awakening our bodies at first, what I really miss about them is these feminine spiral movements. Like so much of that is, like you said, you're sitting in meditation posture with your s straight spine and it's just yeah. so linear. Yeah. But the feminine is, it's round and it makes spiral motions. Right. It's like the mystery, isn't it? The archetypal masculine could be science, but perhaps the archetypal feminine is the mystery, um, the unknown, the things that we can never quite know and we don't need to put words to them, perhaps. 
and just embracing that. And it's kind of scary sometimes, this thought of like letting go and embracing something you don't know at all mm. <laughs> and not being able to name it and put like exact labels on it. Yes. And then to come to a place where you, this, there's this word gnosis, G-N-O, SIS, oh, like yes. this knowing that is inside of your body and deep in your being. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I've heard of, I've heard that word before used, um, especially when I was studying history, because I studied history in university, but it was to do with um, a group of Christians that broke off. I haven't heard it in, used in that sense that you just said. So that's interesting. I'm going to look into that. Yeah, I have heard it used by women who are teaching about feminine Christ consciousness and uh, who are um, associated yeah. with Mary Magdalene and a different or more mystical view of Christianity. Yeah, so it does make sense that you heard it in that context before. In that context, yeah, yeah. I wanted to say, because um, you said that you wanted to hear a little more about the story of um, me working through the chakras and things. And it definitely relates to all of this because mm -hmm. I only just reached the crown chakra probably about um, a few months ago. And so all in all, I think that it took me around two and a half years and it was absolutely incredible. If anyone out there is interested in doing this, it's something that you can completely do on your own. You don't need any guidance. Just even setting the intention is enough to say, okay, now I invite the energy of this chakra into my life and things will begin to happen, which is something that I found. It was really, really very strange and kind of crazy. And um, one of those validations, I guess, of the magic of life actually being real, because I would move on from one to the next and I would know when intuitively it was time to move on. It would feel kind of right. And I would set that intention, say, I would be like, okay, I'm moving on to the sacral chakra. And all of a sudden my whole life would reorganize around that. Lessons would come up and discussions and new knowledge. And then, um, experiences that were a little difficult perhaps, but it would allow me to work through But I'm very glad that I did it in that way from the root up because now, mm. um, now I'm actually working on self-schooling, so uh, teaching myself. And it feels very crown chakra re related, like this whole idea of learning. But I think, I think I'm bringing with me all that I've learned over the last two and a half years. I'm taking time to really... Um, I guess, embody both sides of the spectrum and um, stay balanced in a sense. And I think I wouldn't have had that if I didn't go through all of this already. So um, part of my learning practice is actually to practice things and not just read books. There's cooking involved and there's movement and <laughs> various different factors that I wouldn't probably have done before. It's very cool and interesting and fun. What are some of the things that you're studying now? And how then do you uh, try to embody that? Oh, okay. So right now, I was like, okay, I'm going to start with human history. Um, and I started by looking into the first writings by Sumerian mm. uh, peoples. And that really led me into this whole exploration of the goddess religions and things but then then it kind of took me back a bit because i had to understand something else and then i was like oh you know what i'm just going to be a real nerd and i'm going to start at the very beginning and then we'll work our way down from there so not kidding i'm actually starting with the big bang right now <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah it's really wonderful i love it um so i've been i've been reading a bunch of books i've got on my bedside table i've got a brief history of time by stephen hawking and got carl sagan's cosmos over there and my mind is quite philosophical and i'm always trying to find patterns and think about what does this mean in the bigger picture and um i come across concepts and it, it almost feeds into some of this spiritual stuff that we talk about it's quite funny that like science and spiritualism it doesn't seem to go together but really i think it does i think that we've just ignored it for a long time again that's like bridging the two worlds not either or anymore do you want to hear something 
really interesting that I learned the other day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's see if I can explain this. I've got to get into my little, little teaching mode. Let's see. So <laughs> uh, it's kind of like a thought experiment. When things began at whatever point that was, because scientists aren't quite sure when, you know, the beginning might have been before the Big Bang, it might have been at the Big Bang. We don't know like when time was and perhaps there have been other universes before that and things. But it's um, this problem that they call infinite regression. It's kind of like this idea of, well, at some point there must have been some kind of beginning. And so if we go back to whenever that was, um, everything in science uh, was considered to be one oneness sameness they talk about sameness and i think that that can relate to our like spiritual concept of oneness because it's this space where there's nothing and in in the nothingness there's no variance because you know in this world there's a thing and then there's another thing and that creates difference so in the beginning there was sameness and uh then there was, you know, perhaps a singularity, perhaps um, something that grew and expanded. And from that singularity came difference. Um, the e- essential concept of existence is difference. This idea that out of nothing came a something and another something, and these things were slightly different, and the difference grew. So um, it allowed for gravity to create. Uh, clumps of things like because there was a tiny difference and a variance in like how those things were scattered they were allowed to clump together through gravity and then um, to turn into stars and then eventually into you know galaxies and planets and things like that and without difference um, essentially none of us would be here and it made me think because I think you know in the spiritual world there's this concept going around right now of um the evil dualism of the (laughs) the third dimension oh dear and it made me think well you know um I don't know if it is so evil this idea of dualism the us and them the this and that because that is the very nature of existence from the very beginning and um, I think the oneness is beautiful too. I think to remember that we came from the oneness, but to realize that dualism allows us to experience this world um, in the way that it is, is quite beautiful in a sense. Yes, it is. Yeah. And in it, it ties back to how being all about love and light isn't really accounting for the fact that we have sacred darkness too, and, yeah. and that that void, that deep dark void from which everything arose, or maybe it was pure light. But I I always picture yeah. whatever happened before something uh, of difference arose. Mm-hmm. Um, with, that this nothingness is similar to the the womb, and that that fertile darkness that is then seeded, and but it's like that deep dark feminine came first. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. You know, it really does have a a basis in science too. They talk about um a vacuum. The vacuum is nothingness, but it's a nothingness that has like a shape and into it can pop little particles from nothing. There can be, you know, there can be non-existence and then this particle will pop into it in the quantum field and it is like that, isn't it? It's the womb that's being seeded. It's quite beautiful. All this talk about galaxies and stars is reminding me of the song that I'd like to feature today, which is called Molten Starry Skies by The Feelings Parade. The Feelings Parade is based in San Francisco, and they're a singer-songwriter duo made up of Scott Ferreter and Morgan Willender, who've come together to share their message of radical vulnerability, self-knowing, and interconnection, interconnection, Which is also really fitting for today's episode, I think, because um, of the way that we're going to be getting into just some real honest, some some real honest, real talk. Um, And I'm also happy to have a duet and not just a a female 
songwriter as I usually would, given the topic of balancing the different pathways to awakening and science and spirituality. So a few more words about the Feelings Parade. Their growing fan base knows them for being musical truth tellers who choose to speak and sing about things with a courageous honesty. They create a space for both the ache and the pleasure that come with being human, and their finely crafted songs and stories speak to both with equal reverence. In the song, Molten Starry Skies, there's a line that goes, sing in summer songs in the dead middle of winter time, which is where we're at right now here in the northern hemisphere, approaching winter solstice. And so I invite you to come along for our imaginary ride back to those starry summer evenings and to find those stars and um, that aliveness within yourself now too. Summer songs in the dead middle of winter time. But there's a high rising bright sun in my eyes. My favorite memories, they don't all come from this lifetime. But I remember getting slumber under molten starry skies. Remember no separation between my feet and the places I was stepping. Given was the same as taken. Yeah, yeah, I was alive. I knew I would have to die. I knew I'd give up my life so something else could have a try. Yeah, da 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 da. It's a lovely love that we learn to love, my love You can't undo that kind of love once it has been loved But I believe in the justice of the wild things We wanna breathe, we wanna eat, we wanna fucking be free I remember getting slumber under molten starry skies I remember no separation between my feet and the places I was stepping Given was the same as taken Yeah, I was alive, I knew I would have to die I knew I'd give up my life so someone, someone else could have a try. The Feelings Parade. If you want to hear more of Scott and Morgan's music, then you can find the link in the show notes. Now, back to today's conversation with Zoe Eccles. We were just talking about Zoe's path of bridging science and spirituality in her own life. I kind of put science aside several years ago. I mean, when I was 16, I also read basically, I think it was called A, a Brief History of Everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, by Bill Bryson. I oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. And, and so when I was still really identified with my intellect, mm -hmm. and um, like my the main part of my identity was around being smart, I was yeah. like, let me learn all the things. I want to read all the books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, that's just not a part of me anymore. But I'm glad that you are bringing that interest 
in mm-hmm. and then interweaving it with the spiritual explanations too. Because I, like I said, I think that's the future. I think I was like you for quite a while in the sense that um, I really did step away. I, I left university. I had this kind of promising um, future, I guess, ahead of me. And I mean, I took university very seriously. I loved it. Uh, it was amazing. You know, it was one of my favorite times. But at the same time, I felt I, I went away on a, a study abroad exchange and I kind of felt this sense of there's something else out there that I'm missing. There's some part of me that needs to be found. And so I left university instead of continuing on um, to do a PhD in all of this. And I began to travel the world and I've been doing that for the last five years. Um, I felt for a long time like I was putting aside a lot of um, that scientific, <laughs> academic stuff and it's like I need to just get away from all of this and even at a point I said I said that too to um a lot of the the pressure that I felt even from say the spiritual world too I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves sometimes to act in certain ways and to to become something to be better to try and um lift ourselves up to this point that we imagine we could be at too and I um put aside a lot of my practices and things and that was wonderful because it uh it gave me a space to think about what it was I wanted personally and not what I felt I should do and I I didn't know how long that would go on for but it seems like there was an end where I felt okay now I have a much clearer and more centered motivation and so I found myself slowly coming back to things that I I loved so much, but that I think I had lost the joy because I was coming from the space of like trying to prove myself, trying to be better than what who I already was. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot more spaciousness and not like you're doing something because it needs to lead to something else. I mean, even you're yeah. studying, the self-study that you're going through, it sounds like you're not pressuring yourself oh. in a way that it needs to turn into some kind of a piece of scientific work or some kind of an online <laughs> course. Like it, it can. No. It might. I had this uh, realization a while ago that really, I think I had been thinking of it as like the point is the end product. But then I came to this idea that actually the the things that I create um, are just things that pop out as I go along, you know? It feels almost like, dare I say it, a mission that I've been given in some sense or that I that I care about a lot, something that I perhaps gave myself because now the point is not so much to create something at the end but to like actually just do the thing. Um, and it's really wonderful. It's really fun. <laughs> I love going along and doing it that way. And then things do kind of pop out. Um, I, I was in fear for a while that I wasn't going to end up creating anything anymore. I thought that I was probably too lazy. Um, but no, no, it is, it's like going back to that idea of like living the life first. And then it, it fills you up so much that you just begin to spill out and over um, into the world and you have to create something from it. Yeah. Yeah, I... I- I once heard the sentence, it's not so much where you're going that's important and what you're doing, but who you become in the process. Mm. And that helps a lot with staying patient (laughs) (laughs) when things aren't happening as as quickly as I'd like them to. Um, So you travel the world quite a bit and you've been doing so for several years. Mm-hmm. How do you do it? <laughs> that is a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked because I get a lot of people asking me <laughs> things like that. And let me just say for the record, I am absolutely 100% uh, poor. So <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this idea that you need to be rich to do certain things. And traveling is not something you need to be rich to do. Um, but you do need to be free. That's the mm-hmm. thing. I think that we're equating one with the other but really honestly being free means to me of like being free of um of debt 
is a huge deal. It means that I don't have any any kind of payments to make. If I go away, I go away and that's it. You know, I'm gone. I don't need to make a payment back home. Um, I, I don't have children and that makes it a little easier. Although I do know people who travel with their children. Um, and I don't have pets. That's a huge thing too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I just have my husband, but, (laughs) um, he and I go off together and the way we generally do it and did it. So right now we're, we're staying for a while. We're saving for a year so that we have our own little space. But, um, we actually, we do live with his parents. So there's that. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, we'll come back for a while, kind of save money at some, I don't know, seasonal job. Uh, Sometimes they've been really horrible jobs, but most of the time they're okay. And we'll just kind of save money for a while and then head off again to wherever we're going. Um, And you don't need that much money. Um, We did a thing for a while where we were living in a van and traveling around the US. And that was amazing. The van itself cost money. That was quite a lot to buy a van and kit it out and do everything. We like um, built a bed and different things in the back and it was very cozy. But to travel for... For three months of traveling, I would say you need only around 2,000 US dollars. So it's very cheap, I think, relatively by the standards of living. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We've also done some crazy things. We've done things where we like live in a car and we cook meals in a little gas cooker inside a car and um, (laughs) things like that, where you like shower yourself in a public toilet and, you know, stuff like that. That helps for sure. But Mm -hmm. generally, if you're willing to sacrifice certain things, it's kind of like priorities. You just make a priority on one thing, what you really, really want. And then you let go of some of the other things that perhaps um, you don't need as much. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a very interesting way of existence. And it's difficult sometimes because I come back, like say right now I'm in Colorado, I come back and then I'm here for three months and I'm very happy because you get tired when you're on the road, when you're traveling around and living like that. But then Mm -hmm. after three months, I get itchy feet again and I just want to leave again. So I've got this I've got this case of itchy feet now and I'm just kind of being like, okay, ground in, it's fine. We can stay here for a while, but yeah. Back to that root chakra. Start now that you've mm. finished with a crown, you can start at the bottom. Actually, you could go down <laughs> to your earth star chakra. Have you heard of that one before? Mm. I have not heard of that one. I've heard that there are others outside of the body, I guess more in the aura. That's correct. Yeah. And and your earth star chakra is about maybe like three to five feet below you um, mm. in the earth. Oh, wow. Cool. I love this. Okay. I could, yeah, do a little mini checking in on that one, see what's going on. That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. So you have several things going on. You mentioned that media retreat and yes. rebellion. Then (laughs) there are your portals. Could you just explain a bit what those are? Yeah. So I have a bunch of things that I do. Um, And the portals is is one part of the whole. And so right now it's four times a year, once on the winter solstice, once on the summer solstice. And then um, I've also got one that opens around Beltane and one that opens around Samhain. And these are kind of like online spaces that really dive deep into the season. So they're seasonal portals. And being the historian that I am, a lot of it is really focused on learning about your ancestral heritage. I think especially in, say, America and places where heritage has been kind of conglomerated and we have this new culture and things. It's easy to forget where we came from and perhaps what our ancestors used to do. And even, you know, the Christianization of the world over the last however many hundreds of years has changed a lot too. So going back 
is this remembrance of yourself and this idea that we are um, very connected to the earth, even though we might not we might not normally practice that now, we are still connected to the cycle of the seasons. So there's partly ancestral heritage kind of like notes on that and different things. And then there's um, prompts for like your psyche as well, because I think that, I mean, it's been shown, right, that our, our psyche is affected by the changing of the light and the dark, the, the flowing of the seasons and how it works within your your soul and your being, your psyche, and your physical being and different things like that. <laughs> I love it. I love doing it. Something that I do personally. So the next portal that is coming up on my website is um, the winter solstice one. And I can feel it already. I can feel it kind of brewing. And um, I just want to add that stepping inside this online portal is kind of going like into a fairy tale. I think you have a really aesthetically pleasing way of oh. teaching and of giving small portions of information and the way that you arrange things, your photography, the fonts that you choose is just, yeah, really, <laughs> really pleasing. And I think that we're all often feeling oversaturated with mm. content nowadays. And yes, there's yeah. something to a really simple, clean, mm. but beautiful look that you've chosen. Oh, thank you. It's, it's been like an exploration for me. It's really fun. But I had to ask myself quite a few times, actually, whether, <laughs> whether it's a little perhaps hypocritical of me to be offering all these things online that talk about going out and living in the real world. But oh, the only conclusion I can come to is uh, that it makes sense and that I can reach a lot more people this way. <sighs> it's, it's not a topic that I think we often talk about, this whole what are we doing online and, and why and beginning to really go deep into that and like um, how does it affect us perhaps too it has me thinking a lot about um, where I want to focus my energy from now on online like where what's the most powerful way I can do this because oh, sometimes I get this feeling that on Instagram there is an overwhelming amount of content and whether or not people even take the time to integrate what they read and what they see. So say, for instance, that somebody posts something on Instagram with a suggestion or an idea, whether or not anyone's actually going to then act on that, let alone integrate it because of the way that we scroll through and zoom through everything. Um, I don't know. You know, sometimes I think that the creative energy that I put into Instagram is a little, a little more lost. And then doing something like this, it shows me that um, having a direct relationship with the people who are going through with this with me, like the journey and everything, and being able to like talk about it and also <laughs> share these activities and hear how they shape the person's experience of life it feels very powerful. It's like, wow, this, this makes a difference. I think that actually speaks for creating content that requires an investment. Mm, because yes. once you've paid money for a portal or an online course, then you're going to consume that content with intention. And you know that you've given something of yourself to it and you want you want to return, you want it to change yeah. your life in some way. And I'm currently taking um, Christina's course, She Alchemy, which is all about Ooh, yeah. nature immersion and coming back into our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we have online modules and the Facebook group, but um, those are just tools. And in the end, yeah. it's about the energetic container that's created. Um, way more than the content even. So so I would even venture to say that these portals that you're opening yeah. are way more than the content that you are posting. But it's yeah, like the exactly. energy of the intention to connect with your ancestors, with the cycles of the year, are being open to manifest in the person's life. I think that really brings it full circle back to what we were saying about um, the difference between 
knowing something intellectually as in just reading it and bodily knowing like really enacting it learning it letting it become a part of your life and who you are is a completely different thing (laughs) and so and as you say like when we when we buy something we do have a lot more intention that goes into that um i think that there's certainly a space for um free online content i think that's very important say like with youtube and things but at the same time it makes me consider the way that i have been dividing my energy um and my creative energy into various different platforms and different things and Mm -hmm. i am actually considering taking um less time for creating stuff on especially instagram because I think that it's a lot of fun and I think that's part of the purpose is to have fun. But at the same time, it's um, almost like I'm spending a lot of energy creating things on there that are then dissipating and it does inspire people. I know that they say things, but uh, it's not, it feels more like um, diffusing my energy rather than allowing myself to bring it back and focus on say something a lot bigger that takes more time and huge dreams. I've uh, actually gone through a really similar process with Instagram um, oh, interesting. because Ooh. as an online entrepreneur and with the algorithm, you yeah. can choose to believe that unless you're posting on a regular basis, your content will definitely be lost because it's not appearing at the top of people's feeds anymore. And so as long as you're posting daily and you're using it as a marketing tool, then you're building your following and your following are people that ideally like you really resonate and connect with. Um, But they they are also the ones who know and trust and like you and will eventually buy your creations and your Mm -hmm. products. Now um, at some point, I also realized that the daily investment in a post in posting on Instagram, it's a lot (laughs) and including the scrolling that I was doing myself, it would take one and a half to two hours of my day. And now per week, that would be 10 to 14 hours a week. And, um, that's time that I could be investing into a bigger project, say, yeah, yeah, an episode or a guided meditation or my website. And those are the things that I had been putting off. It's almost like sometimes we're waiting for this um, threshold of fame or not even fame, but just enough people that we think it's worth it to try and continue, right? Like this idea that, okay, so now I am validated enough that I can continue to do the work that I do. And eventually, if you're not getting any feedback, I do imagine that the energy will dissipate. Um, I've been really surprised by how long I've just been really dedicated to this podcast, even though I rarely get feedback or emails. It's kind of like I'm creating into the void, but because it's so much a part of me and such a heart and soul creation and I, there, it's like a non-negotiable. And I, I always wonder, <laughs> yeah. okay, how many more months of living on the edge financially will it take before I'm like, okay, I'm giving, I'm giving this up. I'm going back to quote unquote reality. But right now I'm still just somehow being carried by some divine current of optimism. Yeah. I'm glad you are. Oh, I think that is a beautiful thing that what you're doing, you know, and for it to come from that place. I remember reading, and this is one of those instances where actually, you know, these posts do make a difference, but perhaps we don't um, get that feedback very often, but people remember. So I remember a post that you made And it really spoke to me. It was talking about um, different parts of your life that led up to this point of you creating a podcast. And I remember um, you had written something about when you were perhaps in high school, you were part of, um, was it a radio show or a podcast? Yeah, it was a a monthly radio show. Mm -hmm. Yes. And these stories of like your past and how it all feeds into it. I was sitting there thinking like, oh my God, this person, of course, they're made to do this. Like you mm. really have these gifts and these these things that go into, <laughs> into your passion for this. In the end, it just comes back down to 
the fact that I'm doing it for myself and because yeah. I feel like the divine current of creativity and the plant spirits um, are asking me to. Yes, um, yeah. And your soul. <laughs> like the part of you that is so you, right? Like that just really wants to be. There is a part of me that knows that there are other areas of growth that I might mm -hmm. be avoiding because oh, this really? is comfortable for me. Um, oh, and I think that we're always meant to keep growing. So even though it seems like I'm meant to be doing this because I, I was really involved in radio back in yeah. the day, and um, these are really interesting subjects and people compliment on my voice and such. It's actually, <laughs> like, if I'm totally honest, um, yeah. we're meant to be constantly expanding just like the universe. Right. Can I ask what what kind of things that you're interested in that may be outside of that zone of comfortability? Like, Yeah, um, I think it has to do with making music, singing. <gasps> oh, wow. Oh, that's exciting. I love that. Yeah. And um, offering in-person circles or um, ceremonies. Yeah, but then at the same time, again, it's like, well, why be so harsh on ourselves? Like, it, it's it's fine. We, it doesn't have to be either or. We can have this foundation, this one part of our work that we do feel comfortable in and at the same time still yeah. push ourselves um, in other you know, areas. Recently, I've been thinking, I've always identified with um, perhaps the childlike aspects of myself, but it's definitely grown on me this idea of like the older me that me you know in however many years when I'm maybe 60 years old and things is living somewhere within me or something and it's interesting to think about it because it makes me think actually you know I, d I have a lot of time what I want to do with that time is up to me and what I you know the way I act upon it now but not placing so much pressure on myself to continuously be creating things now knowing that I have time to grow into who I am and um, become <laughs> become some crazy old lady. <laughs> Basically, I'm, I have this idea of, you know, becoming some eccentric. But yeah, I think that the, the fact that you've already arrived, you're wandering the world, but it's not like you're searching for something and it's not like you're mm. wanting money or fame, but just well, to live and to be. Oh, boy. Right? Oh, well, here, let's get really honest right here, because I think, you know, honesty, radical honesty is really important um, to me. And you say, <laughs> you say, I'm not wanting money or fame or things like that. But I have had hopes, you know, I have had hopes that that maybe one day, everything would take off and I would become something big. And I think that's not something new, because it's not it's not something, you know, that I'm gonna negate and whether or not I'm ever going to have a huge audience I think it's important for me to recognize um that desire because it definitely lies as a motivation behind some of my more ridiculous um behaviors perhaps where I would spend a, a stupid amount of time doing things just for just to prove myself, I think, instead of focusing on uh, other stuff. Yeah. I've been playing on this idea recently of kind of like letting that go. The idea of the maybe one day I'll be famous online type thing. Um, because it seems like just more of a distraction than it is helpful. I think that especially letting go of the numbers, because my mind, as much as I didn't want to, I was, I was paying attention to the numbers of things. And that became unhealthy and kind of also like a point of anger or like resentment in me in some sense and letting it go feels very very good <laughs> <laughs> so we you know to me you are yeah. famous online <laughs> well, <laughs> it's all relative it's all it? relative yeah it is yeah. yeah i look at you and i'm like wow she's so she has so many followers, so much engagement. Uh, her content is beautiful and professional. And oh, wow. there is such a thing as a healthy ego. And I would just really, really wish for you that you would grow and reach more and more people because what you're creating is coming from such a place of authenticity. And like you said in the very beginning of this conversation, like your focus is on living first and yeah. from that overflowing cup, then sharing. 
Mm. Yeah, well, I have I have some grand designs in the works in my mind, but I wrote something recently about in the crush of the crowd, we forget what it means to reach one human heart, you know, mm. and it's really that whole thing of can we remember what it is to actually just touch one person's life and to not necessarily change their life, but perhaps add value, add something to what they do and how they think and things. I really love to play around with changing people's perceptions and like um, giving a new perspective perhaps. So to do that for just one person is something very valuable, I think. Yeah. <laughs> to, do, to do that for many is great too, but it, to remember how valuable it is even just for one person's life. Um, what you're saying is reminding me of a song Ooh. by uh, the band Boy, which I won't be able to feature because they're probably um, licensed, but um, I'm just going to go ahead and sing it, okay? I'll just open Ooh. up the lyrics. Okay, yeah. All right. These machines are always running like the rivers and the clocks, and these wheels don't get tired of turning on and on and up and up. And everybody's going somewhere, something's always going on. Barely blink, we might miss out on so much laughter, so much fun. We want our names on all the lists, don't really mind if they're misspelled. And if nobody takes a picture, we'll take pictures of ourselves. Look at us, look how we shine, look how we celebrate our time. The greenest grass right at our feet. Look how we skip from peak to peak. So we're drifting downstream, exposed but unseen, all covered in exclamation marks. Give me something tender, something I'll remember. A touch, a beat, a wave, a heat that hits the heart. That hits the heart, that hits the heart, come hit my heart. Oh, that's so lovely. Oh, okay, what's the name of that? I'm writing that down. It's called but, Hit My Heart. Hit My Heart by Boy? By Boy, yeah. Yeah, but those lyrics, aren't they just like exactly what you were talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Because we're tapping, we're we're doing these likes, thumbs up, and these hearts by mm. double tapping on Instagram all the time. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And we're hitting those small hearts with our fingers, but like, when is there ever something that really, really touches us? Um, I'm going to just ask you a couple of questions that I like to ask all of my guests. Oh, yes. All right. Perfect. Okay. So the first one is... If you were an essence or a blend of essences, mm. what would you be? Honeysuckle and cinnamon. Mm. Because honeysuckle is something so nostalgic for me. It's kind of very, um, very sensual, you know? It's like inviting you into just smelling and doing nothing else except smelling that, that flower. It's so gorgeous. I love it. And it used to grow outside my grandma's um, house. So it reminds me a lot of things. And then cinnamon, because it has some kind of um, beautiful historical significance to it, I think. And I think that is one of those things that used to travel around a lot, right? Like, oh. along with other spices, it was um, traded. I can't get enough of cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> I have a really um, high threshold when it comes to that oh. spice. It takes a lot for me to be able to even taste it. Oh, wow. Do you put it in like uh, like hot chocolate oh, and things? Uh, oatmeal. Oatmeal. Oh, Also nice. my pumpkin soup. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have, um, I have this thing about cinnamon in, um, in savory foods. I really love it. It's mm -hmm. so great. And I always put mm -hmm. it in chili. Like if I'm making chili oh, with yeah. beans, you put a little bit of cinnamon. Oh. It's amazing. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then the second question is, what's your current plant ally and what is it helping you with? 
Hmm, okay. Well, the the first thing that comes to mind is um is sage because mm-hmm. in terms of plants that I'm interacting with a lot almost every day, it's definitely sage. And it's this kind of special sage that lives outside um the property we live on is quite big. And like I said, it's a al- high alpine desert environment. And there's a lot of these sage bushes that the sage leaves are very, very tiny and um, it's very fragrant, almost floral. It's interesting, but it's beautiful. I'll go out on my walks and things. And as I'm going along, I'll kind of like pick one or two little leaves and like rub it between my fingers and smell it. And I think it helps me... Um, ground in and um take pleasure in where I am especially Mm -hmm. here in the middle of nowhere Colorado sometimes I get I get this as I said like antsy kind of feeling where I think about all these places on earth that I want to be and want to go and explore and things and to just take pleasure in what is here and sage is like very Colorado (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of like okay this is beautiful and I can allow this to be my reality for a while and and everything grounding yeah mm, beautiful yeah back down to that earth star chakra mm, <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah well I'm excited um to hear about all of the adventures that are to come for you on the outer and inner planes and I feel like there's just an entire school of creations, um, big and small, ready to, yeah, be birthed from you in the coming years. There's such a wealth. And, um, yeah, and thank you so much for being here. I love talking with you. This is great. I like this concept of kind of um, breaking free of some of the bonds of like who we should be when we're acting as these teachers, as these guides and things, and to actually share some of the human story behind stuff. I like that. So thank you for sharing some of yours with me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us in this wild garden and listening to today's show. I love connecting with my listeners and hearing about what insights you gained. Feel free to leave a comment below the show notes on floweringshe.com. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at Flowering She Rose. If you like this podcast, head on over to iTunes and leave a review, and I'll be sure to send you some extra fairy dust. From my blossoming heart and my buzzing womb to yours, until next time.